For the uh, Bible reading from me this morning, it's not even one verse, it's half a verse, but it's the one that goes with the box that we're all learning and memorising, and so I thought it would be good for us to read it all together. So, can you read with me this passage? Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, Hebrews 9, 27. Oh, there should be an A on there. Sorry, my bad. This is the word of the Lord. Who knows who this is? That's Judge Judy. I used to love watching her show. It's a courtroom show where small claims disputes are presented before Judge Judy. Uh, She'd give a verdict all within 30 minutes. Judge Judy would listen calmly, well, mostly calmly. I mean, some of the people they'd get on that show could make anybody angry. Uh, But she would listen, she'd ask questions, and she'd pass a verdict, deciding who is guilty, who pays, who what, and so forth. She was the judge, the ultimate power in her courtroom. It's a show that people around the world enjoyed watching. I think because, as people, we have a fascination, yet an uncomfortableness with judgment and justice. We're sort of happy to say, uh, we're sort of happy to judge, but not be judged, for justice to be administered, but not on us. We're happy to watch a show like that and say, oh, that guy's so shifty, yeah, he definitely stole that car. (laughs) without actually really knowing the full scenario. Then on the other hand, we don't want people to judge us. We even say things like this, well, that's true for you. I won't judge. You do you and I'll do me. Here's the problem for us, though. We are all judged. When it comes to God as the judge, he is just and fair not impersonal, not apathetic or fence-sitting in his judgment. He has judged, he does judge, and he will judge. He's come to a verdict, and that verdict is guilty. Today we're going to take a tour of judgment. We'll start with the prelude to judgment. Why does God judge in the first place? Then look at how God has and does judge in the present, and then his promised judgment. Then we'll look at some problematic views that humanity has of judgment and finish off with the peace found in judgment. Before we do, let's pray. Lord God, we praise you for your righteousness. We thank you for your creation. We pray now as we come to look at how you deal with the rebellion in and of your creation that you will give us ears to hear and hearts to understand. Please guide us by your spirit. Amen. So the prelude to judgment. Why does God need to judge in the first place? Well, we've been working our way through Two Ways to Live presentation using this book, Learn the Gospel. If you haven't got one, please grab one from up the back where Shamo is sitting. Uh, We're getting back to our roots, to the gospel The good news of Jesus, which we know is Jesus died, Jesus was buried, Jesus rose from the dead for our sins according to the scriptures. Today we're looking at a part of that about judgment. To know why this box is included, we have to look back to what's come before, i.e. the prelude. So box one was creation. God is the ruler of the world. He made the world. He made us to rule his good world giving thanks and honour to him. So we have a job to do, honour the creator and sustainer of everything, but we don't do that, which leads us to the next box, which is sin. We all reject God as our ruler by running our own lives our own way. By rebelling against God's way, we damage ourselves, each other and the world. We turn our backs on God. We say, I can do it better. And we make a mess of things. Now, a just God at this point would and does go, hold up, 
I made you and gave you everything you need. And this is how you respond? Time for some consequences. God does not stay quiet on our rebellion. God does not sit back and do nothing. God has, God does, and God will enact his judgment because we are his creation and so under his authority. He's got every right to judge us. In trying to understand this judgment, something that's helped me uh, came from an article that I read this week that said, judgment is not just the weighing up of good and bad, but rather the thought of vigorous action against evil. Let me say that again. Judgment is not just the weighing up of good and bad, but rather the thought of vigorous action against evil. God's judgment is vigorous action against evil, against the greatest of evils, the rejection of him. We have to remember that God is who he is. He is holy, he is righteous, he is just, he is jealous. And as such, God has, does, and will act in accordance of who he is. So judgment is to be expected on his creation for its rebellion. Judgment against those who do not acknowledge and honour him for who he is, which we learned last week, is everyone. A great line from the book uh, reads, The scriptures constantly assure us that the righteous response of God to our rebellion and to all the sinful behaviours that stem from it is judgment and punishment. So what does this judgment look like? Well, let's have a look at our Bible passage for today. Now, this is going to uh, the translation that's in your Bibles there, okay? But this is what it says. And just as it is appointed for people to die once, and after this, judgment. From this passage, we can see two divisions, I think, in judgment. One, death, and then after death. Let's start with death. Let's start with the present judgment, for which we need to go back to Genesis. I'm going to go back to Genesis chapter 3, and I'm going to read to you chapter 3, verses 14 to 19. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than any livestock and more than any wild animal. You will move on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. He said to the woman, I will intensify your labour pains. You will bear children with painful effort. Your desire will be for your husband, yet he will rule over you. Oh, sorry, still going. And he said to the man, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labour all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground, since you were taken from it. For you are dust, and you will return to dust. The first sin, Adam and Eve's rejection of God as ruler, has massive consequences for the whole world. First, they are kicked out of the garden. No longer do they have that close, intimate relationship with God. Second, they now live in a world cursed and broken by sin, intensified pain in childbirth disturbed and broken relationships, thorns and thistles, toil and labour to survive, and eventual death. This world is not what they had in the garden. It's broken by sin. And we continue to live under that judgement. We see it all the time, don't we? I mean, you watch the news and there's wars, natural disasters, social injustice, illness, disease... I mean, illness, we experienced the brokenness of the world a number of years ago, didn't we, with the COVID pandemic. 
a result of a broken world tainted by sin. Then there's also the decline in human morality. Uh, Paul wrote about this in Romans when he said this, Therefore God delivered them over in the desires of their hearts to sexual impurity so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. God's judgment on the world for sin involves the handing over of sinful people to the foolish and destructive consequences of their rebellion. Basically, it's you want it, have it. I mean, there's so many ways in which God's judgment of sin on the whole world has affected the whole world. And a part of that, which we only touched on before, is death. Now, death is not natural. Humans did not experience death in the garden. Aging, our bodies slowly slowing down and then eventually stopping and returning to dust, that's part of God's judgment on sin. In the book Poison for Breakfast by one of my favourite authors, Lemony Snicket, he writes about ageing. He says this, You can't hate old people. Because if you are not an old person, you will become one one day or die while trying to do so. (laughs) Which is a rather sadistic view on it, but isn't it true? We are all on that same path as a consequence of sin. Do you remember Romans 6.23? Finish this for me. For the wages of sin is? This judgment that we experience here and now, the present judgment, That's what it is. But what happens when we die? Well, we know from the Hebrews verse that when we die, there is also judgment, promised judgment. And man, God is serious about sin, isn't he? Not only do we live with and deal with consequences of sin now, but then we deal with eternal consequences when we die. That's full on isn't it? But this is God we're talking about, the creator of everything. He is holy, just and righteous. He has every right to be angry with humanity's rebellion and rejection of him. So after death, there will be judgment for all people. And not just at individual deaths, but also at the death of the whole world as well. Now, the Bible talks often about a day when God's full and final judgment will be revealed. So our passage from 2 Thessalonians, read early to us by Penny, uh, part of it says this, This will take place at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven with his powerful angels, when he takes vengeance with flaming fire on those who don't know God and on those who don't obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will pay the penalty of eternal destruction from the Lord's presence and from his glorious strength. Now, that's some pretty powerful language in there, isn't there? When he takes vengeance with flaming fire and God's bringing his wrath on mankind and for those who receive this wrath, look at the punishment. It's identified as the penalty of eternal destruction from the Lord's presence and his glorious strength. Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, no longer having an intimate relationship with God because of our sin. When we die, not only are we kicked out, but we suffer eternity separate from God, eternal destruction. Essentially, for the rest of forever, you are excluded from the presence of God. This is a case of punishment fitting the crime, isn't it? Reject God and he'll reject you. It's hard for us to imagine that, but think. God is the most good, pure, holy, righteous being in the whole universe and beyond. And you'll be completely cut off from that. The book of Revelation talks about how good the new heaven and earth will be for those that are saved. Sorry, little spoiler. Yes, there is hope. That's the next two weeks. But think about... Think about the opposite of that description. What a completely, utterly, horribly terrible existence. 
And that's underplaying it. But it's what we deserve. God takes sin seriously. His judgment proves it. In his present judgment that we face in a broken world tainted by sin, and his promised judgment of death and separation from him for all eternity. But then us in our sinfulness, well, we've twisted that, haven't we? Just like we twist and break everything. We've created some warped ideas of judgment, what I'm going to call problematic views of judgment, just so I keep the P thing going. Uh, The book here, this one, it provides some alternatives of judgment. I want to touch on two of these, but I also want to touch on another one that only briefly gets mentioned, but I think is a really big, big thing. That's the idea of karma. Now, this is an idea that a person's attitudes and actions have immediate consequences doled out by the universe. Do bad things and bad things will happen to you. It's a belief in Hinduism and Buddhism. But I do think it's something that some Christians hold on to, but we don't give it that name. We would say things like, well, the negative situation you're going through is because of your sin or an unrepented sin. Now, we know that, yes, the world is broken because of sin, but the Bible doesn't teach us that each individual time we sin, we're going to cop immediate earthly consequences. For example, you know, I I lied to my wife about something yesterday and so in five years' time I'll get cancer or I'm going to be in a brutal car accident. Or something interesting from a couple of years ago, uh, you all remember Israel Folau, he preached a sermon where he stated that the natural disasters that Australia was facing were a result of the same-sex marriage decision. Now, if you want to know more about that, there's a really good article on the Gospel Coalition website. Have a read of it. It's very interesting. But it's not how judgment works, is it? Natural disasters have always happened. They're a result of the brokenness of the world. God doesn't treat people in this lifetime according to their individual sins. Yes, I do think that some sins, the way they work, there are natural repercussions. For example, a married man who cheats on his wife will inevitably suffer broken relationships or worse. That's one example. But natural disasters because of government decisions or life-threatening accidents as a result of past unrepented sins is not correct. Look in John chapter 9. Jesus points out to his disciples that the blind man is not blind because of his sin, nor is he blind because of his parents' sin. It came about so God's work could be displayed in him. God uses the broken things of the world for his glory. This is an area where Christians have got to be careful. We need to remember the whole world is under judgment, and that points forward to the eternal judgment that we all will face after death. Another problematic view of judgment this is from the book is that because God is love, there is and will be no punishment. The God who loves us and made us wouldn't punish us because he loves us so much. People at this point start to think that judgment is in opposition to love, but it's not. Indifference is the opposite of love. Sitting back and letting evil happen is not love. Love is being prepared to do something about injustice and doing it. Take parenting. A loving parent disciplines and punishes their child because they love them. A parent who lets their child run wild may think they are loving by not imposing rules or boundaries, but is it really love? God is more like the first parent, but on a much more epic and eternally significant scale. It's important to remember that, yes, God is love, and so is slow to anger. He does not lose his temper. His anger is always righteous because it's a response to evil. Remember, judgment is vigorous action against evil. 
God is not indifferent. He is just and loving. So, like, think back to the garden. God said Adam and Eve would die because of their sin. Did they die immediately? No. He loved them, so clothed them and sent them out, but they still had to live with his judgment and face inevitable death. The next problematic view is sort of linked to the idea of God is love, and that is the idea of universalism, that all roads lead to the same destination, that no matter what, God will make sure that everyone will get to be with him in the end, despite judgment, because God has no pleasure in the death of a sinner. Now, I I think that is true that God has no pleasure in the death of a sinner. But the fact remains, not everyone will be saved. The Bible is clear on that. Now, at this point, I'm going to stop on that and say, read page 86 on universalism. It's very clear in the book. As I said, if you don't have one, grab one from up the back where Shamo and Seth are sitting. But something that struck me while I was thinking about this idea, you know when you are talking to a non-Christian and they've had a non-Christian friend or relative pass away, and they say to you, at least they're in a better place. They're not, are they? God is love, but there's only one way to him. This leads me to the peace that's found in judgment. Something positive to finish on after such a bleak sermon where we've had a look at why God judges in the first place because he can't and won't let sin go unpunished. We've seen how God has judged and how God does judge and how God will judge, that the consequences are now and, more significantly, eternally. But where is the peace in all this? Well, remember from the God Is series that each attribute of God is not singular. God is all the attributes all the time. It's who he is. So we need to remember that whilst God is just and will judge, God is also merciful and gracious. Now, some people might say, well, if God is just and righteous, why hasn't he just come now and gotten it over and done with? Well, in his mercy, God provides people time. As 2 Peter points out, he delays the final judgment because of his kindness and his patience. Why? He's giving people time. He wants them to have time to repent, to say sorry for their sins. But how can the creation, i.e. us, people, Flawed as we are, stained by sin, how can we come to the creator like that? How can we ask for forgiveness and then be granted it and then not receive the punishment that comes with final judgment? How can that happen? Well, that's grace. And that's next week's sermon. So make sure you come back next week and the next week as we look more at that. Let's pray now. God, our heavenly creator, to consider your awesome power, your wrathful anger, your righteous judgment, we fall in awe before you. We have been confronted with the fact we are sinful, that you do not abide sin at all, and so have, do, and will pass judgment on humanity. Lord, thank you that you have provided a way out for us. Thank you for grace. Help us to be mindful of the fact we are fallen beings and that we deserve your punishment. Thank you for Jesus. Amen.